there's still a lot of stuff to see. I mean, you go down there and, you know, you look at this place and you, you knew something big was down there, you know, just from the size of the foundations. And, and of course, there's, you know, the wading pool and the swimming pool and that. Well, the general area that we're in right now is known as the Loop. This was where the trolleys came in from town and they came up through the valley where 52 is up this way and they came in on the right and circled around and there was a big elaborate waiting station in front of us and they let people off at the waiting station it was covered sheltered they had benches and such underneath so you could wait out of the rain or the sun uh, the people would get off the trolleys and then the trolley would exit and go along the left hand side of the loop and go back down and it took approximately about 20 minutes to ride all the way out to the park Uh, the area behind us here was where the caretaker's house was located. It was called the Lodge. Joseph Bonds and his wife and his 11 children lived here at the park. The house was provided by Union Park. Uh, he was in charge of maintenance and uh, he was a big horticulturist so he had greenhouses in back of his house and he was in charge of all the plantings and taking care of the shrubbery and whatever needed to be to be done. Um, like I said, his greenhouses were up behind there. Uh, you don't see anything left. The only uh, evidence that there's a house is there's an old root cellar back up in the hillside that they use to keep perishables cold in that. Um, the big tree here in front of us is a white pine and that was an original planting that they had put in the ground when the park was opened. And when they put it in, it was probably only maybe five, six foot tall. And you can see now over the years how much that tree has grown. So it's well over 100 years old easily. All right, the area we're in now was known as the Roller Coaster Valley. Uh, they had a huge wooden roller coaster that ran up the valley and back down. It was, as I said, made out of wood and it was real rickety, but we have a photograph of it and it shows, oh gosh, I don't know, it looks like it's at least probably 20 or 30 foot tall. It was quite an attraction down here. Uh, you took uh, a token to ride it. They didn't charge money. You bought a token to ride on it. And I'm not sure how long it took, but it was probably long enough to scare the pants off of you if it shook back and forth as much as some old people have told me, but the area that you're looking at now is known as the fish pond. And the name fish pond is kind of uh, incorrect because actually what they were used for was water reservoirs. I talked to an old lady that had come out here when she was a kid and she says no, it was a holding tank for water because she says I can remember that all along the outside edge were bubblers where you could get a drink. And she'd say, I was always afraid because the noise down here. And she could never figure, you know, what was making all the noise. But here, up on the hillside, maybe 15, 20 yards back in there, was the pump house that pumped the water all throughout the park. And I guess it must have made quite a racket. The area that we're in now was one of the most well-developed areas of the park. Right over in that direction there, there was a dance pavilion. Um, people could come and dance or sit and listen to music. It was a completely covered in structure. Uh, across the creek, there was a bowling alley. Um, right out in front were the bridges. They had a little refreshment stand, an ice cream stand. Uh, this was all terraced off and uh, benches. There was a planter in front of us that was uh, a lot of shrubbery and trees and that. Uh, the sidewalk would have run up right to the dance pavilion and on either side they had small ponds with marble fountains in them. Up on the hillside on opposite of the sidewalk there was a structure called the rustic bandstand, the first rustic bandstand. It was an open air type thing. It was built uh, Adirondack style all out of wood and various musical groups would play music so the picnic goers and people out here would have a little entertainment. Um, you can see the steps going up the hill which would have led to the rustic bandstand and uh, trails and everything up behind it and on this side would have been all lined with benches and people could sit and watch uh, 
picnic goers walk by, listen to the music, but... What's left of the structure we're looking at now was once the Mammoth Theater. Uh, this was the largest theater at that time in uh, 1909 when it was built west of the Mississippi. So it was a huge, enormous uh, building. It stretched from one side of the valley all the way over to the other side. Uh, it held like 1,500 people inside of it. Uh, there was various forms of seating. Uh, the inside they had nice cushioned upholstered seats that would cost you 15 cents if you didn't want to spend that much. The next level back there was wooden bleachers. And if you wanted to see the show for free, the back end of the theater was completely open and you could sit on bleachers outside and look right straight in. Back when they built it, it cost $15,000 to build. Uh, quite popular with the park goers. There would be musical acts, uh, plays, different forms of entertainment down here. Before us is what's left of uh, one of the sidewalks that ran through the park and as you can see it's pretty much broken up and, and, and shattered. Uh, back when the park was open though, this would not have had water on it. Over the years the water picked the easiest course to come down and it picked the sidewalk. Actually when the park was open the creek was on the opposite side of where we are now and ran along the back of the hillside. So this area here was a lot flatter and more open too and from the creek being down here it uh, deposited a lot of soil and silt in that over the years so the, the ground has gotten built up. You can see what's left uh, sticking out of the ground of one of the original iron lamp posts. The bottom of that is probably at least four foot down so you can see over time how much this area has built up. This particular area that we're in now was known as the children's playground. This was one of the most popular areas of the park. Uh, they had a wading pool, which is here in front of me. Actually, this one was built in miniature to one in Ogden Park in Chicago. It is about a foot deep on the curved end and then a few inches deep up on the other end. Uh, there was an open air pavilion that sat at the end of it where the moms could watch their kids. And in a lot of the old postcards, you'll see the kids wading in the pool and they've got their uh, skirts, the girls with their skirts and the boys with their good clothes, uh, their pants pulled up and, and wading, having a good time. Um, up above it, there would have been a lot of the swings and slides and, and merry-go-rounds and that. And further past that, sat where what is known as the Death Pavilion. When the flood hit the park July 9, 1919, that was the pavilion that the family reunion from East Dubuque was on and ended up five people off of that pavilion drowned out here that day during a flash flood. Uh, after the flood, they rebuilt the park, but they never rebuilt the Death Pavilion. Most of the park was rebuilt uh, exactly as it was, where the Death Pavilion sat they built a swimming pool, an Olympic-sized swimming pool. It's 50 by 100 and 8 foot deep at one end. Uh, they also built a road out to the park in hopes of trying to keep it open because by that time um, people weren't interested in coming out to the park anymore for fear of another flash flood or because automobiles were now more easily affordable and people were going out of town and other attractions but they just couldn't get enough attendance so the park finally closed down in uh, 1934. It sat empty for about 10 years and the YMCA bought it in 1946 for a camp for kids and they still own it to this day.